Welcome. Today I would like to talk about accents and other diacritical marks in English. Accent marks, or technically diacritical marks, uh, are usually optional in English, but they can be helpful. If you decide to use any, be consistent in their use. In other words, don't use it for one time and then maybe later on in the same paper forget to use it. Now formally, until the widespread use of personal computers, diacritical marks were all but ignored in standard written English. Native English had no diacritical marks and they were normally dropped uh, from words with foreign origins that might have had them. However, since personal computers have made adding accents to typed work easier, they have become more commonly used. In fact, you may have noticed that some word processors and spell checkers insist on them and will even correct you if you don't have them. Most often, accents are used because they're used in a foreign word that's been adopted by English especially if the English pronunciation is similar to the original foreign pronunciation. So here's a simple example. The dresses were pret-a-porte. Okay, if you're in the fashion business, you know what that means. And there are a couple of accent marks in that expression. It's just a fancy term for ready to wear. Uh, and sometimes also, the accent in a person's name is retained. So, for example, we talk about a play written by Felix Lope de Vega. Okay, uh, in Spanish, uh, the first syllable of Felix would be accented, and sometimes we will retain that because that's the way the man would have spelled his name in Spanish. Now, let me tell you about some specific diacritical marks. Uh, <clears throat> in some cases, diacritical marks do help with the consonants. Okay, you, more common on vowels, but sometimes with consonants. So a cedilla makes the C soft. The cedilla is that little tail that goes on the bottom of a C. So, for example, facade. Obviously, facade is not a native English word. In, word. in fact, it comes from the French. But that tells us that the C is pronounced like an S. So it's fa facade and not facade or something like that. Similarly, a tilde makes an N sound like a NY, where the Y is a consonant. So instead of N, it's ny. And so we have, for example, quinceanera. In fact, notice that word uh, has two N's. One is pronounced the way an N is normally pronounced, but the second one is pronounced like ña, so quinceañera. Um, I have to remember that it's, uh, some older things, the word Spanish, I mean the word canyon comes from Spanish, and some older works spelled it with the N without the Y, and it just was pronounced canyon because it was spelled with a tilde, only sometimes in older works in English, the tilde was eliminated. I can remember when I was young being puzzled by that because I was reading something and it clearly wasn't about weapons, but it had something about cannons, and then I uh, realized that it was actually canyon. However, most accent marks that you do see in English are with vowels. So the grave accent, the accent that goes from upper left to lower right, uh, is sometimes used in poetry or music to show a pronounced syllable in a word where the vowel is usually silent. Um, this would be done only in special cases. And I have to tell you, this preceded the current trend in using accents because poetry traditionally was read or recited out loud. 
And here's an example. In most versions of this poem, you will see the accent mark. And there she lulled me to sleep. Normally, we pronounce the word lulled. But here it has that grave accent to show that the E was to be pronounced as part of a second syllable. Usually that is to keep the meter or to fit the tune of a song. Now the acute accent is sometimes used to show a long A sound with an E. And with some words, modern spell checkers will insist on it. So a lot of uh, spell checkers or word processors, if you were to type fiancé, they would automatically throw on that acute accent. But it shows us that it's not fiance or fiancé, but fiancé. Now, these two words, in English anyhow, are pronounced the same, but they are spelled differently. Sometimes people will ask, what is the difference? Okay, very simply, fiancé, without the second E, is male, a man engaged to be married. And fiancé, with the two E's, is female, a woman engaged to be married. Now, in English, occasionally an acute accent is used in a song or a poem to show an accented syllable that is not normally accented. Kind of like the grave accent to show a syllable that's usually not pronounced separately. This preceded the current trend in accents, once again, because poetry was commonly recited or read out loud. So here is an example from Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. There's a line where a character says, is this my own country? And the author actually spelled country differently from the usual spelling and added the accent mark both to emphasize that the accent was on the second syllable where normally when we say the word country we put the accent on the first syllable. And of course you may recall from English classes where you had to scan poems that the acute accent is used often with the brev to show an accented syllable when scanning a line of poetry for its meter. So here's an example you know, from Romeo and Juliet. You might remember doing this. You write the brev, uh, I sometimes call it a truncated U, for unaccented syllable and then the acute accent for the accented syllable. So you know it's but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. That's kind of exaggerating it, but it does show us the way the line would be scanned in poetry. And that also tells us, of course, if you remember, that it is iambic pentameter. Now, the brev here indicates an unaccented syllable, but otherwise is not used as a diacritical mark in English, except sometimes in dictionary pronunciation keys. And in the pronunciation keys and dictionaries, the acute accent is commonly used to show the accented syllable or syllables in a word. So sometimes you will see a dictionary entry that looks something like this. If you notice, the accent points to the first syllable, which tells us the first syllable of the word syllable is accented or gets the stress. Also, uh, you may notice that that particular key also has a brev over the I to show that that, uh, uh, that Y is pronounced like a short I, a short vowel in that pronunciation key. Not all pronunciation keys do it that way, but uh, this is pretty common in uh, dictionaries. Now, in English, there are a handful of words that are homographs, words that are spelled the same but pronounced differently. And the acute accent helps distinguish between two different words that otherwise would be spelled the same but pronounced differently. This is something that is becoming more common 
But if you think about it, for certain words, it is helpful. For example, expose and expose. Two different words. Yeah, they're related, but two different meanings. One is the verb, one is a noun. And the expose has the acute accent on the E because that shows us that it's pronounced like a long A. Uh, resume and resume is another example. Now, in, the, in this case, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, <coughs> word resume, of course, comes from the French. <coughs> excuse me. And the French actually have an accent on both E's. The way we pronounce resume in English, uh, we would not uh, put an accent on the E, but usually your word processors will insist on that because it is the French way of spelling it. Another example that might be familiar, at least for those of you from Louisiana, uh, file and filet, okay, two completely different words. Um, there's a famous song, Jambalaya, that talks about filet gumbo. Or peak and pique. Again, two different words with two very different meanings. Peak uh, is a verb, and pique uh, is a noun, a type of cloth. So sometimes the acute accent can help us in pronunciation with certain homographs. Not real common, but they do show up once in a while. The next accent diacritical mark is the diaresis, which is two dots over the vowel. And it's sometimes used to show a vowel in a pair that's pronounced separately in a word where it would normally be silent or part of a diphthong. In some languages, the first vowel may take the diaresis, but in English, it's placed on the second vowel. And this also occasionally preceded the current vogue of using accents in English. A uh, simple example is Noel. Um, now, in many cases, Noel, without the diuresis, is a man's name, and it's pronounced with one syllable, that, and it's a long O. Um, whereas Noel, with the diuresis pronounced in two syllables, is you know, the synonym for Christmas. So that may again be even helpful in distinguishing between the names Noel and Noel. But hopefully you see how that is used. Um, uh, another one that used to be fairly common was the word cooperative. Uh, now because the word cooperative or cooperate, you know, other words like that, cooperation, uh, have become pretty common in modern English, uh, a lot of times no special punctuation is used, but the diuresis was commoner for this word before the 20th century. Sometimes today we'll see it with a hyphen too. Another one that the word processors often just put in automatically is the diuresis over the I in naive. Again, if we saw that in regular native English, we would pronounce it as a single syllable word, na uh, naive probably, but with a diuresis it tells us it's naive. Uh, another one you may have um, <coughs> wondered about uh, was uh, Charlotte Bronte. The Bronte family spelled that final E with a diuresis to show that the letter is not a typical silent E, uh, that it's pronounced Bronte, not Bront. <clears throat> There's a kind of an interesting story behind the uh, Bronte name. In fact, uh, Bronte, kind of spelled that way, with pronounced that way, uh, is actually the Greek word for thunder, like Brontosaurus, just means thunder lizard. And um, Charlotte Bronte's father's uh, Irish name was actually Brunty, spelled with a, a U and a Y, B-R-U-N-T-Y. But uh, when he was being called to the church in England, um, one of his uh, seminary professors 
uh, suggested that he change the spelling of the name to uh, make it more classical looking, and, and that's what he did. And that's why there is a diuresis on the E in the Bronte name. Now, in some languages, the diuresis denotes a change in the pronunciation of vowel. We see that especially in German and with the Chinese U, um, which is pronounced E, something like that. Now, in modern English, uh, a name with this accent is often spelled with it to show its origin or its pronunciation. When it's used to change the pronunciation, this is sometimes called an umlaut. And we have a couple of examples. Uh, Dusseldorf is a well-known German city. Uh, the U is spelled with the umlaut or the diuresis. Uh, famous German author Goethe, um, again the O has the diuresis. Uh, the uh, Chinese author Xu Yongzi, um, again that uh, U has the diuresis, so it's pronounced differently from the Chinese U without the diuresis. If that was the case, uh, without the diuresis, the name would be Xu, be you know, almost like what we wear on our feet. <clears throat> Um, one other thing about the word diuresis. The word diuresis, like so many of these terms, comes from the Greek language and has various spellings in English because Greek has a different alphabet. So sometimes it's spelled D-I-A, sometimes it's spelled D-I-A-E, and sometimes the A-E is elided into the single letter, but it's the same word. Now, also, some people make a technical distinction between diuresis, which shows two vowels pronounced separately, which is what it's normally used in English for, like the difference between noel and noel, and the umlaut, which indicates a change in pronunciation of a single vowel. And of course, that word umlaut, you can probably guess, comes from the German, because the German language uses that mark. The umlaut, defined this way, is never used in native English. I, I should mention, in case any of you were curious, uh, in the 80s, certain heavy metal bands used it in their names because they thought it looked cool, but it had no other significance. It didn't it change the pronunciation or anything. It was just a sign that you were a long-haired hard rocker, I guess. <clears throat> uh, you also may have come across the circumflex. Uh, the circumflex uh, is a little bit like an upside-down truncated V. Uh, some people say it's a letter with a roof on it. And it usually signifies that an S used to be in the word but is no longer pronounced. And we mostly see it in words English is taken from kept, French, uh, where they've kept the French spelling. In fact, um, two fairly common uh, expressions that have that show us actually the origin. Tabla d'hote, you might remember that from a song in The Sound of Music, uh, but it literally means the host's table. And if, in English, uh, we never lost the S, and so we, print, we don't pronounce the, uh, the word ult like they do in French. We pronounce the S, so we pronounce it host. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is another example. And Cote d'Ivoire is the uh, name of a country. Um, in English, it's called the Ivory Coast, an uh, African country. But again, we can see that in English, we have retained that S pronunciation. Um, so we say coast and not cote, like the French. OK, so anyway, this is uh, very simply review of the different accents um, and you <clears throat> may you know come across them now you know what they mean so let's just uh, quickly review the main ones okay the sedella is a tail below the letter usually the letter C uh, as in the word curacao and it makes a norm normally hard C pronounced like an S okay the tilde is a wavy line above a letter, uh, 
we have some words mostly coming from the Spanish uh, where we see that above the letter N and it makes the N pronounced like ña. And then there's the grave accent. The grave accent falls from left to right as in, say, the song title, Frere Jaca. Uh, and it's also used in poetry to show a normally silent vowel is pronounced. Uh, another example of that is a line from Hamlet, uh, Hamlet's famous to be or not to be speech, uh, where it says, the pangs of despised love. Okay, that shows us that uh, Shakespeare probably meant for that uh, E, the second syllable, or the third syllable of despised, uh, to be pronounced separately. The acute accent is the accent that rises left to right, uh, as in the expression e de fix, uh, and it makes the letter E pronounced like the English long A. And in poetry, it shows a stressed syllable that in normal pronunciation would not be stressed. I gave you an example of that as well. Also, of course, when you're scanning a line of poetry, it's used to show which syllable gets the accent. The diuresis, two dots above the letter, is in the name Zoe. Uh, and this shows a vowel being pronounced where it normally would be silent didn't uh, have that uh, diuresis, we might want to call this person Zo. But, uh, the diuresis tells us that it is indeed Zoe. And then the circumflex, an upward pointing angle over a letter, uh, such as the word rotisserie. Uh, this notes that the original word had an S that became silent. And in fact, the word rotisserie or some menus might even see roti, uh, shows us the example, the origin of our English word roast, where we still pronounce the S that's become silent in English. Well, thank you very much, and I hope this has been enlightening for you.